Okay, the word of God is accurate. For example, in the book of Psalms, chapter 14, I believe, the, the word of God says there is no God. What? Yeah, that's what men say. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, when I tell people, I always get people with that one. What do you mean the Bible says there is no God? Okay, I got your attention, didn't I? All right, yeah, it's in there, but it's accurately stating what the fool thinks. Doesn't mean it's right, okay? But it's accurate. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what we have here. This is an accurate statement of someone who believes in multiple gods. Okay? So when you read this and you have, for example, uh, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, that's, a, that's not a misprint. It's not referring to the holy God of heaven. Uh, this is Belshazzar's um, understanding from a person who worships multiple gods. Okay? And before him, I told the dream. O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Okay, so why did he call everybody else in and him last? <laughs> That's an interesting thought since he was, he's, he's over them to start with. All right, tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair and the fruit thereof much and, and it was meat for all. And the beasts of the field and the shadow under it, the fowls of the heavens dwelt in the boughs thereof and all flesh fed from it. And I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, Thus, hew down the tree, cut off its branches, shake off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowl, fowls from its branches. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. And in, um, when we're looking at, this, at these passages... Behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. Um, these visions and prophecies come with their own eschatological language. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor Ted? All right, we got a tree here. Uh, it's like the book of Revelation. Satan is also called the what? Prince of the power of the air. All right, the, the, the serpent, right? Now, Satan's not a serpent. He's a, he's a uh, fallen angel, right? Um, so we, we have literal interpretation to um, such things as this tree, such things as a mountain, for example. So I'm going to use that. Um, in Daniel 2.35 it says, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. All right, now it's not a literal mountain that fills the whole earth. Okay, obviously. So uh, what does that mean? Well, in eschatological uh, language, that's an, that's an empire. That's a kingdom. So look in Isaiah chapter 2. Book of Isaiah Isaiah chapter 2. I'm using this as a parallel so we can appreciate how these things um, end up interpreted. So look in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And let's back up verse 1. Uh, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house. Okay, um, you got to help me out. I don't know what that's doing. 
um, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. All right, so obviously when it says the mountain of the Lord's house, <laughs> all right, and then over here we have be exalted the hills and all nations flow into it. This big mountain, well, no, it's the, um, it's the kingdom. Okay, it's the kingdom. A mountain in scripture symbolism means a kingdom or authority or rule. Um, we find that in our own book. If you look in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. Daniel 2, 35. Um, we know that, and we have studied thoroughly of this section, so you should be familiar with it, I would think. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2 and in verse 35, okay, we have this big image, right? And we know what that image represents. It represents all of these great empires, right? Now in verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together. That's all these layers of of, of empires okay and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great what mountain, mountain and it filled the whole earth. okay obviously there isn't going to be this big mountain that fills the whole earth. all right come on <laughs> all right so you understand this eschatological language Symbolism is used. Symbolism is used uh, just like we have uh, the beast that comes from the sea in Revelation 13. Well, that's the Antichrist coming from the multitude of people. Okay? Um, so when we see this, this language, that helps us to understand better uh, how to uh, appreciate uh, what's going on here. So this imagery is used. It reminds me, it reminds me of the parables. When Christ spoke to them in parables, you remember, he would take things um, that, were, um, that were known in physical life, like the seed of the sower, okay? Um, Everybody knew agrarian lifestyle. That was very prominent back in our Lord's day, okay? Uh, everybody knew what seed is. They knew what sowing seed is. They know uh, what it is to sow seed in good ground and not such good ground and so forth. Mm -hmm. he, used that par he used that parabolic teaching and put the spiritual application to it, right? Okay, so when we're here in Daniel chapter 4, we're working with this tree. Uh, and let's go back, if you will, in chapter 4. Um, and verse 10, Thus were the visions of mine head and my bed. I saw, behold, a tree in the midst of the whole earth. <laughs> okay, we have this one tree um, in the whole earth. And the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong. And the height thereof reached unto heaven. Now, you know that's imagery. You know that's symbolism. And the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. It could be seen from everywhere. Okay? All right. Um, this tree happens to be a great king. And it happens to be Nebuchadnezzar himself. Uh, this is a very personal vision. And there's a moral to the whole story, okay? Daniel, led by God, has to make this, um, this truth known. Not just to Babylon, but for Israel, for that remnant that was being faithful, okay? And in verse 17, we, we get the bottom line, okay? Verse 17, this matter... 
is by the decree of the watchers. Now, I promise to tell you what that is, and hopefully we'll get to it today. And the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and, set us, and set us, sets up over it the basest of men. Um, this is the point of all of this vision. Israel needs to understand that and wouldn't hurt if uh, Nebuchadnezzar understood that and he did for about a year. <laughs> then I guess he had a moment and he forgot. <laughs> and so <laughs> the vision came true. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Got to appreciate the irony a little bit. Okay. So um, let's look in the book of Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel 31. Um, we're looking at the parable of the cedar of Lebanon. And this is speaking uh, against the pride of Pharaoh. Uh, much like the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he walks out among his hanging gardens one day and decides that all this kingdom and all this greatness and all of it's all about him. And so the tree was hewn down for about seven years. Okay, so look in Ezekiel 31. It came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of, king of Egypt, and his multitude, who, whom art thou like in thy greatness. And behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon, with fair branches and with shadowing shroud and a high stature, its top was among the thick boughs. And the waters made him great and deep set him, um, the deep set him up in high with her rivers running round about his plants and set out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field and his boughs were multiplied. His branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs. And under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Pretty big tree. And the cedars in the garden of the God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. That's saying something. I've made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick boughs. And his heart is lifted up in his height. Uh oh, 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 here we go. That being lifted up, that's being arrogance. That's what that is. Become arrogant. Um, uh, the book of Proverbs would say, smoke in the eyes. Okay, smoke in the eyes. Uh, in the New Testament, the billows. Puffed up, you know, billows puffed up. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heaven of the heathen. He shall surely dwell with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nation, shall cut him off. And I have left him upon the mountains and all the valleys. His branches are fallen. His boughs are broken. All the rivers of the land, all the people of the earth are gone down. His shadow and have left him. You get the idea. God raised him up and he got arrogant about it. Right? So God brings him down. <laughs> okay? Uh, why? Because the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. A uh, man gets off with the idea that he thinks he's running everything. 
Um, let me give you another idea. Just, uh, it's a little bit off base, but uh, it's appreciated for what our Lord says in the book of, of John 15. You remember John 15. I am the true vine. Remember that? And my father is the vine dresser. And we're told to abide in him. Well, here's why. Because this is the false vine. Uh, for, to appreciate what the true vine is, you've got to know what the false vine is. So look in Isaiah 5. Now will I sing to my beloved, my well-beloved, a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. I'm in Isaiah 5. Now verse 2. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wine. not what we're looking for. Okay? Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a video and you should. Uh, get a video on vine dressing and see what these guys have to do with these vines. It's a lot of work, okay? <laughs> it's a lot of work, and you'll understand John 15 a little better, okay? But anyhow, here's the, here's the false vine. Israel's the false vine. Jesus Christ is the true vine. But now notice, and now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and then my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Uh, in other words, what more could I have done for this nation than I have done for it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild. Great, can't use them. Not for what? The vineyard's supposed to be for anyway, mm -hmm. okay? And now go to, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, it shall be pruned, it shall uh, lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. All right. Now you're getting into what? The blessings and the cursings of evil. Uh, this, this nation would not follow me. I'm not going to protect it. The, the, the hedge is gone. I'm not going to, to work it. I'm going to allow the briars and the, and the weeds to overrun it. That's the nations trotting it down. You see the imagery. Um, uh, no rain upon it. Uh, that's one of the plagues of the cursings of evil. And notice, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness. Behold, a cry. Then we get into the woes. Like Jesus Christ quoted the woes on the Pharisees and the scribes. Um, we have a, another a passage like this in the book of Habakkuk. We have a set of woes. Unrepentative judgment for sin. But you see the imagery. This pertains to Israel themselves. Judah. Okay. All right, let's look one other passage here that might be helpful. Look in the book of Luke, chapter 21. The book of Luke, chapter 21. Luke 21. And let's look, if you will, please, in verse... Luke 21, verse 29. Luke 21, 29. Uh, again, it's a pair. This is a parabolic teaching of Christ. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. And when they now shoot forth, ye see the, and know of your own selves that summer is, is now nigh at hand. 
So likewise ye, when ye see things come to pass, know ye the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. When you see these things coming, like the fig tree, when it's about to give its fruit, you know that it's time. Well, when you see these things about the kingdom coming, you know the kingdom is at hand, nigh at hand. Okay. Um, he can... Jesus uh, compared the kingdom of heaven like the grain of the mustard seed. It becomes a great tree. Look in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 21. No, Matthew 13, 31. Matthew 13, 31. Now that's tough for a dyslexic. Flipping numbers like that. <laughs> just want to let you know. 13 and 31. That just almost isn't fair. So look in verse 31 of Matthew 13. Another parable put he forth unto them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come lodge in the branches thereof. What's he speaking of? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. The little mustard seed. Now that's used in, in other examples and illustrations, isn't it? Right? Faith of them what? Mustard seed. Little teeny seed. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen them. I mean, they're, they're hard to deal with. They're that small. Um, and it becomes a what? Great tree. Okay, uh, so that's, uh, that's a little bit uh, what we wanted to appreciate here. Uh, let's go back, if you will, to the book of Daniel 4. The book of Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4. So we see that Jesus Christ uses imagery and parabolic teaching in his own. And the, so we can and understand, I'm, I'm taking uh, pains about that, so you can see why the interpretation is what it is. Okay? All right. Now let's look down here further. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached into heaven. Okay, let's, let's move over to verse 28 for a minute. And all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might, by the might and of my power for the honor of my majesty? Okay, it's all about him, right? <laughs> all right, it's all about Nebuchadnezzar. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. There you go. I guess it took about a year, but I guess the arrogance caught up with him, right? And they shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. Seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You didn't get it when the vision came to you. It was interpreted. You had to go and fulfill it now, didn't you? So now we're going to we're going to put you out in the field for a while. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. Now, what is this imagery all about as it continues? How great this king is and how much greater he gets. Okay, that's what this imagery is telling you. 
um, verse 12, the leaves thereof were fair, um, the fruit of it, uh, the fowls of the heaven uh, and all flesh fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head upon, I'm sorry, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed and behold a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Okay, program's about to change. All right. So the angels, that's the, these are the angels, the watcher and the holy ones. Those are um, different kinds of angels. We'll get into that in a second. The watcher is an archangel, similar to that of Michael or Gabriel. That's what a watcher is. Look in Daniel chapter 9. Need to know a thing or two about angelology when you get in this book, by the way. They're all over the place in here. Look in Daniel chapter 9, and let's look in verse 20. Um, we've preached this at prayer meeting, Daniel 9, ages ago. And he is confessing the sin of the nation, how they disobeyed and wouldn't follow God, and so forth. Now, let's look um, in verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking, a holy mountain is what? This is a specific holy mountain. This would be Jerusalem. Okay? Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee that thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, don't try to make this the church. It has nothing to do with it. Okay? This is about Israel. This is about Israel and what God is doing with Israel in the future. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. Tribulation. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not, but not for himself, and the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood into the end of the war, Desolations are determined. Who's this against? Jerusalem. Who's going to come in? Antichrist and the nations. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice of Galatians to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate. Uh, even until the consummation and the determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's about Jerusalem. He's going to make a league, even with those in Jerusalem, and later break it. Okay? Uh, this actually gets to be a little bit of fun. All right, in reference to the vision Daniel receives, look at 815. <coughs> Daniel chapter 8. And in verse 15, 8, 15, it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision. Now, 
this vision is about, um, I, I can't get into it all, is how Jerusalem basically is going to be trodden underfoot. Okay? And sought for the meaning then. Behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a name, a man's voice between the banks of the Uliae, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. And he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. Um, okay, so we are, are, are understanding here. Now, theophany as well. Uh, notice, uh, if you will, here. Um, let's look, if you will, also in the book of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Uh, let's look in verses um, 18 and 19. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in, in years. Now, Zacharias, uh, who's born to Zacharias and, and that house? That is who? John the, John the Baptist. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. So if you ever get visited by an angel, do indeed listen to what he has to say. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. All right, verse 26. <laughs> and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in under her and said, Hail, thou art, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when he saw, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth the son, thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. <coughs> now, um, let's look just a bit further in the book of Daniel again. We're going to go back to Daniel chapter 10. These watchers, these holy ones... Uh, there's prophecy, there's messages being coming right from the throne of God. Look in Daniel chapter 10. I want you to look in verse 13. I really can't start there. It's not going to make any sense. Let's look in 1010. And behold, an hand touched me and set me up upon my knees upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken um, this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. And the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Now, 
That is the rank of a demon, a fallen angel, withstanding Daniel. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me and remained there with the kings of Persia. And now, and, and now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall the people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Okay. Um, I wanted you to see how all of this works out. Look in chapter 12, 1 and 2. Chapter 12, 1 and 2. Um, you think, oh boy, not now. All right, look in 12, 1 and 2. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So Michael is the what? The archangel of Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never had, was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone shall be found written in the book. That's the remnant. And many of them shall sleep and the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, so we see how the watchers, the holy ones, are used here in reference to these, to these kingdoms, right? And then even the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. <coughs> All right, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of who? The archangel. the archangel. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right, let's look in the book of Jude, verse 9. Jude 9. Um, I hope, if nothing else, we get rid of any kind of cartoonish idea about... Uh, principalities and powers. Okay? There's a holy war being fought all the time. <laughs> the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. God's program is being forwarded by these mighty angels. Um, look in the book of Jude and look in verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil... He disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring an against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. All right, you have to appreciate the power of these angels as well as these fallen angels. God and the angel of the Lord, his archangel, his seraphim, uh, let's look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Um, we have the seraphim and the cherubim. The seraphim and the cherubim. Look, if you will, in Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, chapter 6. And let's look. Oh, boy. Yeah, okay. Um, verse 1. In the king that... In the year that King Uzziah died, you remember Uzziah, right? He, he went into the priest's office. He had no business there. He ended up a leper. Remember him? I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Um, which one had six wings with Two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Uh, this is at the calling of Isaiah. The calling of Isaiah. 
Um, let's look in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, I get uh, kind of a kick out of those fellows, that uh, these preachers. I'm going to go tell Satan this and tell Satan that. No, you're not. <laughs> if, if Michael would not say, but, but the Lord rebuke thee. Who in the world do these guys think they are? <laughs> Pieces of dust. Um, look in the book of Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5. And also out of the midst thereof came likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a of calves foot and they they sparkle like the color of burnished brass and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their foresides and and they four had their faces and their wings their wings were joined one to another they turned not when they went they went everyone straight forward as for the likeness of their faces they had they they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. Um, I'm reading this for a reason. Get the Milton Bradley idea out of your head about angels okay um, you can read on here that there, um, there are rings with the wheels within wheels of these living creatures full of eyes okay um, we have these four living creatures in the book of revelation that are praising god um so we need to see clearly uh, Satan, the kingdom of darkness versus God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God and light. I have so many examples here. But let's go and look in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Just to try to bring it home, I'm over as it is. Look in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. Chapter 4. That's not what I want. I want Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what? Be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God. <laughs> okay. Uh, and stand having done all to stand. I know that there's a holy war going on, you see. Okay. I can't get to much of this else. I'm out of time. But I wanted to explain to you um, God's uh, movement, the power behind these, these um, the, the kingdoms and behind his kingdom. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for who thou art. We thank you for the interpretation so needed. And Father, we, we uh, are... That's um, an awesome thing to consider, the spiritual warfare. Um, and Father, these, these uh, fantastic beings, and Father, we thank you today that our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, for, for who he is, and that he has defeated the enemy. And Father, we look forward to his coming. And Father, may we be wise and understanding.
that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And Father, we just pray that you would bless us this day as we walk by faith with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Millie, I'll be back to haunt you on Tuesday if you won't let me see you. <laughs> like to see you and encourage you today. Would that be possible? What you say? like to see you and encourage you today a little bit. Would that be possible? I guess. Okay. That's a little better. All right. Um, I'll go to the nursing home and I'll see you later. And there it went. I hate this thing. Okay. Zoom. We're going to get, we're going to move to show time. <laughs> Okay, Lois, are you still there? Nope. Okay. That was a different number, by the way. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll get that for a minute. This phone book from Chilcotti, his phone system is getting skinnier and skinnier. It's not needed anymore. A lot of people getting rid of them landline phones and going to cell phones, I guess. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of businesses probably getting into cell phones. Well, you Google now. Yeah. You Google. Find yeah. out what you would need by Google. Okay. Do you have that number? Because I know this one hasn't worked in a long time. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I just want to see if it's the same number that I have here on which 708 Yeah, that's her cell. She's at the home number. Huh? She has a new home number. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Which is which? The cell phone is 708. So that's the new cell number? No, that's her no. cell number she's always had. Okay. But when she just came in today, huh? what number was she coming in on? No, it's gone. Should be this right huh? here. 835 well, something. Reason? Yeah, right there. 835, that one. Okay, that's the one I need. Oh. 835-8397. You think that's what she was using? Mm -hmm. I know it was. Okay. Yeah, she, got, she got a new phone, I think. She almost got cut off. I thought it was one of those house deals. We want to buy your house. I get one every day. 835 so I tell them, yeah, half a million dollars. <laughs>